Good morning, afternoon, evening, night, whenever you're watching this, welcome back to the Mr. Sin channel. Today we're going to be talking about Unit 2, Topic 6 of AP Psychology, the brain. By the end of this video, you'll be able to identify different key locations of brain structures. You'll understand their functions, and you'll have an understanding of different contributions made to our understanding of the brain. And if all of that sounds good to you, well, smash that subscribe button, hit that like button, and let's get learning. So it is no secret that the brain is one of the most important organs in your body. It has over 86 billion neurons, over 100,000 miles of axons, and over 10 trillion synapses, and consumes 20% of your body's oxygen. Those are some pretty impressive statistics, if I do say so myself. Now, brain research dates all the way back to the first century BC, where Hippocrates started speculating that a person's brain was split into two halves, and each half was capable of independent processing. Now, over time, there have been many people who have made significant contributions to our understanding of the brain, but for time's sake, I'm only going to talk about two of them, Carl Wernicke and Paul Broca. Both looked at our brains and language. Paul Broca first identified a region in the left cerebral hemisphere of the frontal lobe, which became known as Broca's area. This area of the brain is in charge of facial muscles that are needed for us to physically speak. Broca based his hypothesis off of case studies of patients who had damaged an area in their brain, which resulted in the individual losing the ability to speak. This became known as Broca's aphasia, which is the loss in ability to produce language. While the individual may lose their speech, they still are able to comprehend the language. Carl Wernicke discovered the area in the cerebrum which is responsible for language. Wernicke created a model that looked at language. He believed that the part of the brain known as Wernicke's area, located in the left temporal lobe, creates meaningful speech, while Broca's area, located in the left frontal lobe, determines movement needed for vocalization and sends that information to the motor cortex. If Wernicke's area was ever damaged, it would result in the person losing meaningful speech. A person would still be able to say words and sounds but they would have no real meaning, and they also would no longer be able to comprehend sounds or speech. This disorder became known as Wernicke's aphasia. So the brain is part of the central nervous system, and as we can see from research done by Broca and Wernicke, each part of our brain is in charge of specific tasks. The brain can be broken up into three major regions. The first region is the hindbrain, located at the bottom of the brain. Moving up from the base of our brain, we have the smaller midbrain. This part of the brain is difficult to see because it's surrounded by the last region of our brain, which is the forebrain. The forebrain is what most people typically visualize when thinking about the brain. Starting out, the hindbrain is made up of the pons, the medulla obligata, and the cerebellum. These parts of the brain allow us to survive by controlling our basic biological structure. The medulla takes care of important autonomic functions. These happen without us consciously thinking about them. It's located right above the spinal cord and below the pons. This part of the brain is going to regulate your cardiovascular and respiratory system. On top of the medulla is the pons. The pons is primarily a bridge between the different areas of the nervous system. It connects the medulla with the cerebellum, and it works with the cerebellum to coordinate movement. The main functions of the pons that we're going to focus on this video is with sleep and dreams. A tip for remembering the pons is to think of the pons as a pillow, P for pillow, and it's located on top of the bed, B for brainstem. Next we have the cerebellum, which is located at the base of the brain in the back. The main function of the cerebellum is that it allows you to maintain balance and maintain manage your coordination, so you're able to walk straight in a line without tripping over your feet, and you're able to scoop cereal into your mouth with a spoon instead of tossing it on your head. It also plays a role with things that require practicing to improve, such as playing an instrument or learning to ride a bike. It helps your body remember how to perform those actions. The cerebellum in Latin is called the little brain, since it's two wrinkled halves that look like a brain attached to the brainstem. If this area becomes damaged, the cerebellum would make a person's movements very unbalanced and clumsy very much like a drunk person who can't walk a straight line. And since I've mentioned the term brainstem, let's quick go into a couple specifics about the brainstem. It's located at the base of the brain on top of the spinal cord. It includes the medulla, the pons, and the midbrain. If the brainstem is ever severely damaged, the result is death because the functions of the brainstem is the autonomic function. We also need to quickly talk about the spinal cord. Remember that the spinal cord is what connects your brain to the rest of your body. It starts at the base of your brain and runs down the spine. Think about it like the information highway. The spinal cord allows your nerves to send information from your brain to the rest of your body and vice versa. All right, so we talked about the hindbrain. Now it's on to the next region, which is the midbrain. This is on top of the brain stem and just right above the hindbrain. This part of the brain is very difficult to observe since it's buried under the other parts of the brain and is very small in humans. It's actually the start of your brain stem. When thinking about the midbrain, think about a relay station. Visual and auditory information is sent here and then sent to the appropriate structures of the brain. The two important structures of 
of the midbrain are the reticular formation and the reticular activating system. The reticular formation is a structure that tunnels down the brainstem. Its main function is arousal in the awake and sleep cycle. And if you damage this area, you'll go into a coma, so don't damage it. This structure contains lots of neurons from different parts of the brainstem and coordinates reflexive and autonomic vital functions, such as respiratory control as well as pain modulation. The reticular activating system encompasses the reticular formation, but it's also a network of nerves that run through the brainstem and out to the thalamus. Its function is to stimulate higher centers when something important happens that needs immediate attention. For example, when someone says your name, it is screening and filtering the incoming stimuli and sending that information to the thalamus. Now, so far, we have spent some time talking about the midbrain and also the hindbrain, which are responsible for our involuntary function. Now, we're going to go into the forebrain, which is in charge of our voluntary function. The forebrain is the largest part of the brain. It allows us to have complex thoughts and also behaviors. The forebrain, it consists of all parts of the brain except for the brainstem and cerebellum. The term forebrain is a way to describe the region. Cerebrum is the name of the brain parts that are not the brainstem and the cerebellum, which equal roughly about 85% of the brain. The function of the cerebrum is all brain processes that aren't just for survival, like complex thoughts. Moving deeper into the cerebrum, we have the cerebral cortex, which is a thin outer layer of billions of nerve cells that cover the whole brain. These neurons are called gray matter. All higher cognitive functioning happens here. Inside of the cerebral cortex is the corpus callosum. This structure is shaped like an arch that stretches from the front to the back of the brain. It's made up of different nerve fibers that connect the two cerebral hemispheres. This allows your hemispheres to talk and communicate with one another. One trick to remembering this is to think about the corpus call, awesome, as calling the other hemisphere to communicate. The cerebral cortex can be broken down into two different hemispheres, a right and a left, and this is where we get into our four different lobes. The first lobe we'll talk about is the frontal lobe. As the name suggests, this lobe is located in the front of your brain. It's actually right behind your forehead. Its function is higher level thinking, and we can see there's two important areas of this lobe. The first is the prefrontal cortex, which allows you to have foresight, judgment, speech, and complex thought. This lobe will continue to grow and develop develop into your 20s. This is also where your Broca's area is located. Remember, we talked about this area at the start of the video. The second is the motor cortex, which allows you to have voluntary movement and is located in the back of the frontal lobe and runs from ear to ear. It's kind of like an arch. The left motor cortex controls movement on the right side of your body and the right motor cortex controls movement on the left side of your body. The motor cortex is represented by a figure called the motor homunculus. This shows us a visual representation of the amount of brain area that's dedicated towards a specific body part. What we understand from this visual representation is that more brain tissue is devoted to the body parts that are the most controlled by us, like our hands and our mouth. The next lobe is the parietal lobe, which sits on the top of your head, right behind the frontal lobe. It's separated by the central sulcus. The main function of this lobe is to receive sensory information. It lets you understand different senses, such as touch, pain, temperature, and spatial orientation. All right, so remember how we talked about the motor cortex and how it sits like a headband from ear to ear? As part of that frontal lobe? Well, the somatosensory cortex is parallel and touching the motor cortex. It's located in the front area of the parietal lobe and is in the front of the parietal lobes in between the parietal lobe and also the motor cortex. The somatosensory cortex is part of the parietal lobe which allows you to register touch and movement sensation. This is what is in charge of your skin. The left sensory cortex controls sensations for the right side of your body and the right sensory cortex controls sensations for the left side of your body. And of course, just like we talked about with the motor homunculus, there is also a sensory homunculus. This is a visual representation of the amount of brain area that's dedicated towards a specific body part in relation to how sensitive it is to stimuli. What we understand from this visual representation is that there's more brain tissue devoted to the body parts that are the most sensitive, like our hands and tongue. You'll notice there is a difference between the motor and sensory homunculus. Behind the parietal lobe is the occipital lobe. This is the lobe that makes it possible for you to see. This is located in the back of your head. Here you also have your visual cortex. Now, if you're struggling to remember where this is located, just try to remember the saying, they've got eyes in the back of their head. Now, the visual cortex is located in the bottom of the occipital lobe, and your eyes do kind of an interesting thing when they process information. The left side of your visual cortex is actually interpreting the information that comes in from the left side of each eye, which is reading the right field of vision, while the right side of your visual cortex is interpreting the information that comes in from the right side of each eye, which is interpreting the left field of vision. Now, up next is the 
the temporal lobe, which is located right above your ears on both sides. This lobe helps you recognize faces, smell, hear noises, balance, and assist with memory. This lobe consists of a few different parts. First, remember Wernicke's area. It's responsible for language and also comprehension. It's located in the temporal lobe. We talked about it at the start of this video. Located near Wernicke's area is the angular gyrus, which allows you to read words on paper and also transfer that information as an auditory form. This is what allows you to process what you read. Also located in the temporal lobe is the auditory cortex, which is located in the upper areas of the temporal lobe. This cortex is what processes your hearing and is actually hearing what is happening from the opposite ear. One last thing I wanted to highlight about the lobes is that they all have association areas. These are regions of the cortex which connect the sensory and also motor areas. It allows us to have higher level thinking, process our external information, and lets the cerebral cortex communicate with different parts of the cortex. Association areas make up about 75% of the cerebral cortex. All right, the next structure we're gonna talk about is the thalamus. It takes all the different sensory information that you get every single second and sends that information to the forebrain to be interpreted. So right now when you're watching this video, the sound and the visuals are being picked up by your eyes and your ears and the thalamus is sending the sound information to the temporal lobes and the visual information to your occipital lobes, allowing you to understand the information in this video. The thalamus is a two symmetrical egg-like structure at the top of the brainstem. Next up is the limbic system, which is a ring-shaped group of structures between the brainstem and the cerebral cortex. The function of the limbic system is emotions, learning, memory, and some basic drive. First up is the hippocampus. This structure is surrounding the thalamus, and it's inside the temporal lobe. This area allows you to create memories. This is how you learn new information and form memory. Remember, this is where memories are created, but not stored. That's going to be important to distinguish. Next is your amygdala. This structure is located at the end of each arm of the hippocampus. Two round clusters on the end of each arm, to be exact. This is where you get your emotional reactions from, specifically fear, anxiety, and aggression. Under the thalamus is the hypothalamus, which keeps your body balanced. This allows us to have homeostasis. This is what controls your drives, thirst, hunger, temperature, and of course, sex. The hypothalamus also works with the pituitary gland to regulate and control your hormones. Remember, we talked about hormones and also the endocrine system back in our Unit 2 Topic 2 video. So that's the limbic system. Now, don't worry, we are almost done with the video. We're down to our last two brain structures. But before we get there, if you're finding value in this video, don't forget to hit the subscribe button and drop a like on the video. It's free and it lets me know that you want more content. Okay, so first we have the nucleus accumbens. This is located in the forebrain near the limbic system. It's associated with drug dependency as its function is in the pleasure and reward circuit and motivation. And last but certainly not least, we have the basal ganglia. These neuron cell bodies are involved in intentional body movement. They link the thalamus with the motor cortex. So the information that is sent from the motor cortex gets modified by the basal ganglia. Damage to this area leads to Parkinson's, cerebral palsy, and Huntington's disease. The basal ganglia are located in the midbrain and also the forebrain. Now, believe it or not, this was actually just a quick overview of the brain. There's a lot more complexities to the brain and more structures that we could get into. But for now, we need to practice what we just learned. Answer the questions on the screen and check your answers in the comment section below. And when you're down there checking your answers, don't forget to go to the description of this video and check out my ultimate review packet. The packet has information on every single unit of AP Psychology. I also have more practice sheets for the brain, the neuron, the endocrine system, the nervous system, and also all the other units. There's topic review videos, practice quizzes, answer keys, and much more. It's a great resource that'll help you get an A in your class and also a five on the national exam. Plus, there's also the Discord server there where you can study with thousands of students around the world. And of course, don't forget to hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out on any future Mr. Sin content. Thank you guys so much for watching. I'm Mr. Sin, and until next time, I'll see you online.